All right, family, family, family. Pins ready, Bibles ready. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I pray this has been a a good day for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, for this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be what? Glad in it. Uh, when you get a little bit of time in your spare time, you ought to go back and look at what David was going through in his life as he penned those words. It will give you a much deeper appreciation of that particular verse that we say sometimes very haphazardly. Um, but David was going through some things in his life to where depression frustration and anger could have been the thing that he could have been proclaiming um, but yet he said this is the day um, regardless of what he was going through at the time he still found uh, ways to give God praise um, it's an amazing passage of scripture that you would do well to go back and study in your own time but uh, let's go ahead and bow for a moment of prayer if we can um, as we go to the Lord in prayer and I ask that the Holy Spirit would do as only he can. Um, and as I told the um, individuals in the Sunday school on last Sunday, how arrogant we are when we come into God's house and attempt to discover his word, but do not honor him in consecrated prayer. Prayer is not just throwing up words to the ceiling and hoping that they break through the tiles. Prayer is communing with God. And the old saints used to say that what needless burdens we bear when we don't carry everything to God in prayer. Uh, but hear this, saints of God, prayer is not always talking. Effective prayer is listening. See, God already knows what we need, but we don't know what God wants. So if we would spend more time listening as opposed to throwing our grocery list out there to God, uh, we would see some miracles performed in our lives so just for a moment just for a few seconds i would just ask that you would just settle yourself in just for a moment of silence is not honoring anybody's death but just a moment of silence that you may allow your mind to rest Father, in Jesus' name, would you, on this day, lead and guide us into all truth. Father, I pray that whatever issues we came into this building with, Lord God, that we would understand that whatever they are, no matter how big that they are, they're not bigger than you. Help us to keep our problems in perspective of who you have revealed yourself to be. And Father, help us to have faith that no matter how difficult it may be, Father, that you are well able. I thank you for your people, Lord, who come week in and week out to break open your word, to study, to show ourselves approved. I pray that you would remove any anxiety, remove any fear, anything that would hinder the Holy Spirit from depositing your truth into our lives. Not to make us smarter Christians, but to help us to live the life that we believe you want us to live. Um, Father, help us in the areas that we struggle and help us in the areas that we continually trip up on. Help us, Lord God, because you know us in and out. You know us better than we know ourselves. So, Father, we don't lay down empty promises to you. Father, we're asking that you would move according to your word and that you would give us what your word says is rightfully ours. So, Father, have your way in this place today. Um, allow your spirit to move and to minister. And we will be careful to give your name the praise, the honor, and all of the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, and thank God. Thank you very much, everybody. So if you do have your Bibles, I want you to turn over to the book of Acts. I want to um, show you a couple of things in our text today. Um, you do know that Acts is the start of the Christian church. 
And oftentimes, well, in the Bible, in studying the Bible, in theology, there's this thing called the law of first mention. And the law of first mention says wherever something is broke, you must first go back to the time to when it was not broke, right? So when mankind, when mankind was perfect, what did the world look like when man was not under a fallen nature? You'll find those in Genesis chapter 1 and, and chapter 2. And we'll find in those particular chapters in Genesis when there was no fall, that man was communing with God every single day. But Genesis chapter number 3 happens, sin enters into the world, and then man falls into what we typically call a fallen state. And everybody in this room, no matter how deep our religious pedigree may run, you live in a fallen state. Okay, no matter how many T's you cross or no, how many I's you dot, you live in a, in a fallen state. And that means that we live in a state of sin. I don't have time to kind of dive into the depths of this, but sin is the one thing, the only thing that Jesus came to account for. Heaven is a byproduct of salvation. It is not what God did not come down to die on a cross so that you can go to heaven. That's, that's, not, that's not, listen, heaven is a byproduct. It's, it's a fringe benefit. Jesus came to die to restore man's relationship to God pre-Genesis chapter 3. And the only way that man could be restored to God was that sin was dealt with. But since every man post-Adam was born into sin, no one could solve the sin problem, therefore requiring Jesus to come to this earth. And as you look post-Genesis chapter number three, you see a lot of stuff happening in our world today, and it is just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until the eventual return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, saints, people are going to people. People are going to do people stuff. Okay, the minute that you think that they won't is the minute that they do it. People are going to do people stuff because even with the Holy Spirit, you still got to fight back your flesh. Can somebody say amen? amen? Even being good and saved, you still got to harness your emotions. In Acts chapter number 16, I want to walk you through a few verses before we get to verse number 35 because we're talking about when guilty people refuse to apologize. However, there's a backstory to this that will help us to understand contextually where we are. We are living right now in a world to where people live in disrespect. Like people are majoring on disrespect. And it, it is a, it's a crazy time because I want you to hear this. You get to choose whatever you want to do but you don't get to choose the consequences from the choice that you made. You can do whatever you want to do, but you can't control the consequences of said action. Does that make sense in the house? And we're living right now in a world to where people have mastered disrespect. They have mastered disrespect. They have mastered disrespect. I want to just step back for a moment before I get into Acts chapter number 16 and tell you this, that God has a lot to say about respect. And a man can never respect another mortal man unless that man first respects God in which the image he is made. If a man will not respect God, he will never respect you. And ladies, let me tell you something. If you want a good gauge of your husband, you better watch how he treat his mama. Because if, if he will cuss out his mama, you better listen to me. Before you say I do, you better find out what his mama say. But we're living right now in a perpetual world to where everybody wants to do what they want to do regardless of the consequences that follow. It's a, it's a discouraging time to some degree, but then on the other side, it's an unfolding of scripture. Let me tell you how this plays out practically in my own life today. Today was a very stressful day for me. It started off with getting pulled over by an unlawful traffic stop. Uh, did not argue, presented all my credentials, stopped lasted about five minutes, but trust me, oh, trust me, oh, trust me, I'm going to fight this in the court of law. 
start off with an unlawful tra uh, traffic stop. And then I get to the Church of Bethel's family where we have the academy going on. And I got to deal with so many things as soon as my foot hits the door, one right after another, one right after another. So I go straight up into my office as my usual routine is and try to close my door for a minute to gather my thoughts to make sure that I'm right with God before I try to go deal with God's people, which sometimes are hard to deal with. So even after that hard day, it came out about mid-noon. Before I came down and started interacting with God's people, I had to make sure that I was okay because I need you to hear this and you need to say this in your own life. Just because you had a bad day don't mean I got to have a bad day because of your bad day. Amen. You don't have the right to ruin my day because you had a bad day. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Take your bad day and go in the corner and get your bad day right before you start interacting with people. Amen. Here's my lovely wife right here, and I tell her, and she tells me, problems that happen at the church stay at the church. Do they do? They do not come to Battle Creek Drive. Amen. Hello, somebody. Amen. But disrespect is all around us. And I want you to see something of how Paul deals with this post the fallen nature of man, because it's something that unfortunately we're going to have to deal with. And just because we're Christians does not exempt us from dealing with bad people. Amen. Go down to uh, Acts chapter number six. I want to catch us up to speed here and start at verse number 16. This may sound familiar with you. If you came to church a couple of days ago, a few Sundays ago, you heard this from the pulpit. But in chapter number 16 of Acts, verse number 16, look at what it says. Now it happened as he went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Underline that. Verse number 16, because this sets up the rest of the chapter. Paul and his associates are now getting ready to go to another town. They had just come from Troas in verse number 11, and they are getting ready to enter into another town. And there is this young lady that is following them, and she has a spirit of divination. She has a demon. Watch well, this. She's a fortune teller. Let me help you out a lot. Horoscopes. Let me help you all out. Palm readers. That's divination. That's a spirit. That's a demon spirit. Checking your horoscopes every day. Why? Who cares if you are a Sagittarius? Posting it all on you. That's another story. Verse number 27, this girl followed Paul and us crying out. She's not whispering it. She's crying out. These men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Nothing on the surface sounds wrong with that statement. In fact, it is all the way true. She's identifying the men of God. She's identifying what they are doing, but she is following them from town to town, crying this out in a loud voice. Watch verse number 28. And she did this for many days. But Paul, watch this, Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, a man that wrote 13 books in the New Testament, full of the Holy Spirit, a man that wrote 13 books in the New Testament. Watch what it says in verse number 28. Paul got annoyed. And he turned to her and said to the Spirit, he turned and said to the spirit, he turned and said to the spirit, not to the young girl, but to the spirit who was controlling the young girl. Y'all remember Ephesians chapter number six. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul didn't take his anger out on the child. He took his anger out on the spirit that was controlling the child. Verse number 28, greatly annoyed, he turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now, I'm in the Baptist context. I know Baptists don't deal well with demons. Y'all don't believe in demons. Y'all don't believe that people can be possessed. Y'all don't believe that people can be oppressed. Y'all don't believe that people can be puppets of demonic spirits. I'm here to tell you that they can. In 2023, there are people possessed by evil spirits. Paul recognizes this, does not take his annoyance out on the girl because he recognizes the spirit behind the girl. So he goes to the problem, not to the symptom. 
and commands the spirit to come out of her. Now watch this. Please hear this. The spirit recognized the authority of Paul and came out at his beckoning. But if you just for a, for a moment write down in your margins, Acts chapter number 19, there was another man who tried to do this exact same thing. And he said, I cast you out in the name of Paul's God. And then a demon said unto him, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? And the demons jumped on that man and beat him out silly so much so that he ran out of the city naked. Your authority does not come from your position. Your authority does not come from your title. Your authority does not come because you are a member of the church of Bethel's family. The authority that makes demons tremble comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ only. So I want you to see this in verse 28. He came out at that very hour. But when her masters, take that up to verse number 16, take that up to verse number 16, because remember, this girl is making a lot of money for her masters because she is a fortune teller. But when a master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. They saw their money was being messed up. They saw their money was being messed up. They saw their money was being messed up, and they seized Paul and Silas. I want you to make a couple of mental notes here, because Jesus Christ, when he comes into a person's life, please hear this, everybody. He doesn't come softly knocking on your door. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, he overturns everything. Jesus Christ is a wrecking ball, y'all. He comes in wrecking relationships. He comes in wrecking what you think you know, what you don't know. He comes into your life, into my life, into our life, turning over tables. And when they got a hold, and when he got a hold to this young girl, the masters who were making money off of her, who obviously didn't care about the girl, but only the money that she was making from them, got pissed off. and said, somebody's got to pay. Sees Paul and Silas. Verse number 20, and they brought them to the magistrates, underline that word magistrates, because that's going to come up in just a little bit. Magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Now notice the response. The people who seize Paul and Silas are the magistrates and they call them Jews. It's a very important verse, verse number 20, because it's going to come back up in our text a little bit later on. Verse number 21, they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. So they put them in prison. And then you go over to verse number 25, the infamous verse, at midnight, they praying, they singing, singing uh, hymns of joy, even though they have been put into prison falsely. And then that became a great earthquake. Y'all know the story. Earthquake happened, shackles fell off of the hands, doors open, Paul and Silas are free. The jailer wakes up. Notice he didn't wake up during the earthquake. I don't know how anybody sleeps through an earthquake, but apparently this jailer did. And he wakes up and he sees all the prison cells open and he's getting ready to kill himself because he, if he has to go back and report to his superiors that all of these men are, have escaped, he will lose his life. So he says, I'm just going to end it before my boss is cut off my head. I know that I'm dead. And then Paul, right before he gets ready to cut off his head, said, hold on, man, we are still here. Pick it up in verse number 31, in verse number 30. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? The jailer is so impressed. Now, please hear this. I don't, man, I don't have time, but man, it, it's important to understand verse number 30. He brought them out and he said, what must I do to be saved? Because the jailer knew why Paul and Silas were in jail. And the jailer knew that Paul and Silas were in jail for unjust cause. And the jailer knew that these were trumped up charges, but the jailer was watching and listening to how Paul and Silas responded to their situation. Yes, a complete stranger, an unbeliever is listening because you keep telling everybody on your job how much you love Jesus. You keep telling everybody in your family how much you love Jesus, how they should come to church. But the minute a storm hits your front door, you lose your everlasting mind. And all the people that you've been talking to Jesus about are now seeing the effects of what Jesus has in your life. And they simply say this, and you can't blame them. 
if that happens with Jesus, I'm good without him. But the jailer is listening. And he's listening to them praying. He's listening to them singing. And he is so impressed. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse number 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Watch this, men, you and your whole household. This is the jailer. He said, what must I do to be saved? He got saved first. And then he took the gospel back home to his family. Priest, provider, protector. Can I get an amen for some of the fathers who take the gospel back home to their own families? He got saved, and then he said, I'm going home to take this life-changing message to my wife and to my children. And verse number 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and his whole family were baptized. Uh, verse 34, now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his house that's the context verse number 35 starts off like this and continuing off and remember now they're in the they're in the jailer's house he's showing great signs of hospitality he's feeding them they're rejoicing they're probably telling each other testimonies they're praying and all the stuff that he heard in the prison they're now doing in the middle of his living room but verse number 35 says and when it was day Meaning when the light came on, when, sun, when the sunrise came up. Remember in verse number 25, it's midnight. Now it's about 6, 5.45-ish. The sun is beginning to break over the horizon. And the magistrate sent for the officer saying, let these men go. Now take number 35 and draw a straight line over there to verse number, 20, uh, uh, verse number 19. Does everybody see this? I want you to see verse number 19. But when her masters saw that their hope and their profit was gone, they seized Paul and dragged him into the marketplace. In verse number 20, excuse me. And they brought them to the magistrates. The same magistrates in verse 20 is the exact same magistrates in verse number 35. I got to walk with this slowly because I want you to connect the dots. The magistrates are the leaders. They are the civil leaders of the day. And the magistrates now in verse number 35 know that they've made a mistake. They know that they've made a mistake. Look at verse number 35. The magistrates called to the officers and saying, let these men go. Watch this. Please hear this in verse number 36. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying the magistrates have seen, have seen, have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. No problem. No harm. No foul. We messed up. Don't tell nobody about it. Sneak out the back. You go on with your life. I go on with mine. Now, I'm a firm believer. Don't make a private apology to me when you fooled me in public. What happens in public needs to be apologized in public. Come on, talk back to me. Now, don't do me dirty in public, and then when we get home, you say you're sorry. No, we're not going to play that game. What happens in public needs to be admonished in public. So now here the magistrate saying to Paul and Silas, hey, we messed up. We did it publicly. We scourged you publicly. We threw you into the prison in front of everybody publicly. But our bad, we messed up. We messed up. Now y'all just scoot out the back. No harm, no foul. But Paul's got a real big problem with this. Paul in verse number 37 says this. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly. Uncondemned Romans, stop. Go back over to verse number 20. Because these magistrates didn't know that Paul and Silas were Romans. They thought they were Jews. Why is this important? Because Romans, by Roman law, could not be crucified, could not be beaten without a public trial. Paul knew that. And said, they've, they have sentenced us, sentenced us, uncondemned Romans. And when he heard the word Romans, he shook in his boots. Because if they did that, then he would have to answer to Pilate. And if he had to answer to the Roman governor, there's a high probability that Roman, the Roman governor would have killed the magistrates after he had found them to be in the wrong. But Paul says, listen, I know who I am. I'm a Roman citizen and I've been done wrong. Can y'all just push the brakes here just for a second? 
the magistrates are what we call in our day politics. I want you to see how fluid Paul was in civil government, state government. I want you to understand how he moved in those particular circles. He was a Christian, but please hear this, he knew who he was voting for. He knew the issues of the day. He knew the laws of the land. He didn't bury his head, his, his, his head in the sand and chose not to learn all of the things that everybody else can benefit from. So Paul said, this verse number 37, he said, they can uncondemn Romans and they have thrown us into prison and now they want to let us out secretly. Watch these two words. No, indeed, exclam exclamation mark. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you what he said. I can't tell you what he said. But after this is going on, Paul said, no, we're not going to do this, everybody. They did this to us publicly. Now they have to apologize publicly. No, indeed, let them out and let them come and see us out. He says, bring those same magistrates that caused us all this harm publicly and let them escort us out. I want to hold your attention there just for a second, and I want you to go over to the book of Galatians. Hold your hand right there and go over to the book of Galatians. And I think we're going to be in Galatians... Let's be in Galatians 6. Let's look at Galatians 6. We're going to walk a couple of places here. Uh, 728, okay. Look at Galatians chapter number 6. And start in verse number... Let's start in verse number 2. Verse number 2 of Galatians chapter number 6 says this. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something... When he is nothing, he deceives himself. Verse 4, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who is taught, or him who teaches. Verse number 7, do not, do not, be deceived. God is not mocked. Strong statement. And then he tells you why God is not mocked in verse number eight. For whatever a man, uh, verse number seven, for whatever a man sows, do y'all see that? Do y'all see whatever? Uh, underline the word whatever. Whatever a man sows, that also shall he reap. In life, you are getting the seeds that you have sown. And you know the, the crazy thing about a seed is that a seed doesn't pop up right away. Sometimes a seed takes days, weeks, months. You're talking about a, a, a Chinese bamboo tree, it takes five years before the bud spikes through the ground. The life that you're living right now and whatever is coming your way right now may be the sum result of a lot of seeds that you've planted in your life. That's why, everybody, you better be careful how you treat people. Everybody. Listen, I go where I'm celebrated, not tolerated. You better be careful how you treat people. Because lying begets lying. Hate begets hate. Envy begets envy. You need to be careful the seeds that you're sowing because one time in your life, those seeds are going to start busting through the ground. Look at verse number eight. For he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit will reap of the spirit. Take your hand and go over to your right to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to come back to Acts. We're going to finish out Acts, but I want you to Turn over to the right and go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12. A really good book. In verse number, let's go verse number, let's go number, uh, verse number 14. 
Hebrews chapter number, what did I say, 12? Yeah, 12. Verse number 14. Look at this. Pursue peace with all people. Stop right there. It's 731. Okay. I'm going to give you, y'all write this down. Sovereignty versus free will. And remember, I'm going to come back to Acts chapter 16, so don't lose your place over there. Everybody in this room agrees that God is sovereign, right? You've been in church long enough to know that God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and doesn't have to uh, acquiesce to anybody. Everybody knows that and believes that, right? In order for God to be God, he's got to be sovereign. If God is not sovereign, he cannot be God because a God is all sovereign. He's all controlling. However, with God being all sovereign, God gives us and only us this unique thing called free will. Deacon and Sister Smith, the, out of all of God's creation, none of God's creation has free will. The grass must grow. The sun must come up. None of God's creation has free will, except for what he did in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. He gave us, the people that were made in his image and in his likeness, free will. Now, this is going to blow your mind. He's sovereign. He controls everything, but he's given to creme de la creme, his chosen uh, uh, creation, free will. And this is what God says. I love you beyond measure. Plans that I have for you are wonderful, but I'm never going to force you to do anything. The love of God is so great, so great that he won't force us to do his will. I love this woman with all of my heart, my mind, and my soul. I will walk through a bed of fire for this woman. But if every day of my life this woman woke up and said, I don't want to be with you, I don't want to be with you, I don't want to be with you, as deep as my love is for her, I would have no choice but to let her do what she wants to do. No matter how much you love your children, no matter how much you love your children, how smart they may be, how wonderful they may be, they may make the choice to not do what you want them to do. But that's the greatest expression of his love. And so everybody in this room, God wakes us up every single day and say, man, I got a plan for you today. I want you to walk this way today. I want you to experience me in this way today, today, today. And all of us at some point in time throughout the day, make a choice to either follow God or rebel against him. But he's sovereign. He can make you do it. But see, love that is forced is not free love. That's a dictator that makes you do something that you don't want to do. Do you realize how many people right now are caught in the cycle of life of doing something that they don't want to do? That if you gave them another option of doing something else, they would take it in a heartbeat? But God will never force himself on you. God will never force himself for the marriage to work. God won't force y'all to stay together. God won't make you to come to church. He won't make you do any of that stuff. He's sovereign. The dogs obey him. The cats obey him. The whales obey him. The stars obey him. Everything obeys him, but he gives us the choice to not obey him. It's amazing when you think about it. Because all of us want obedience. But God is so sovereign that he says, I control all of this stuff, but I love you more than I love lions. I love you more than I love elephants. And I'm going to give you something that I did not give them, and that is the choice to love me back. I want to know what you did with that choice today. I want to know if, if anybody in this room, everybody in this room, all of us, what we did with the choice of loving on Jesus. Because watch what this says in, in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 14. Pursue peace with all people and with holiness. Pursuing peace. But some people don't want peace. Y'all know them just like I do. Their lives are just one big ball of fire. And misery love company. So if I'm not happy, you're not going to be happy. And everybody, please hear me. That's why you better choose your circle very, very, very wisely. It's okay to take your presence away from people. Because he said pursue peace. 
I've shared this with you, and I think it's helpful to say it again. Peace is more valuable than silver and gold. I'm not arguing with nobody at 50 years old, y'all. I'm not arguing with nobody at 50 years old. It is just not worth the time nor the energy. It's too exhausting. He says, pursue peace with all people, for without, talking about holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Go back two weeks ago in the same setting when we talked about the racial relations and everything that we're going through in this world, that if we can't pursue peace with people here on earth, how in the world are you going to live in peace in heaven? We got to do our best to pursue peace as the same way that God has prescribed. Now go over to your left and go to Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18, 1037. Matthew chapter number 18 and park over there right around about verse 15. Now, many of you guys know this scripture. Unfortunately, this is probably one of the most misquoted scriptures in all of the Bible, or one of them. You know, one of the most misquoted scriptures, you can go ahead and, and start if you like, is in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. But where there are two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. It doesn't take two or, pe uh, two or three people gathered in order for Jesus to be there. It doesn't mean what you think it means. I can be all by myself and God be there because I have the Holy Spirit of God. Matthew chapter number 18 has strictly to do with church discipline. Something that we don't like to talk about a lot in the church of God, but let's talk about it now. Look at this in verse number uh, 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you. Now, let's set the scenario. Your brother sins against you or you sin against your brother. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Go tell him his fault. Right now in the academy, I love all of my wonderful kids, 112 of them right now. But the people that we're having the most problems with in all of this drama lace world that we're in is our girls. Like girls love drama. Teenage girls especially. And it's all, hey, you know what she said about you? She talking about you. Look at what she put on her social media. And then one tells another and another tells another. And then another tells another. I mean, you know, if I tell Sister Holman something, tell her something, by the time it gets over there to Deacon Smith, it's 55 different stories. Because everybody's going to put their own twist on it. But if your brother sins against you or you sin against your brother, here's the first thing that you need to do. Be mature enough to go to your brother. You say, hey, man, I thought uh, I heard we uh, think we got some differences we need to talk to, talk about. But you know, if you're like me, you don't want conflict. Does anybody here like conflict? No, we don't like conflict. Nobody likes conflict, except if you're crazy. But most normal people try to avoid conflict. Can y'all say amen to that if that's true in your own life? It's okay if it's true. We want to avoid conflict. And so if we find ourselves in a very contentious situation, we typically like to draw away from that situation. But the problem is when you draw away from it and not address it, the situation gets bigger. And when it gets bigger, more people get involved. And when more people get involved, it gets extremely convoluted. So I want you to look at this in verse number 15. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. You and him alone. You and him alone. Two people, not three, not four. Don't bring your homeboy. Don't bring your homegirl. Two of y'all go and talk it out if it is possible. If he hears you. Said, man, that was just a big misunderstanding, man. My apologies about that. I really, I'm really sorry about that. If he hears you, the Bible says you've gained a brother. But verse number 16 is right behind 15, and it comes up with this word, but. It would be a wonderful thing if conflict was, was resolved that easily, huh? Man, wouldn't it be wonderful? If we just go to each other, we figured it out five, ten minutes, man, we on about our way. We dapping up. We going to get something to eat and everything is fine. You know, that's not how it works a lot of times. Because one person is going to say to the other, one of them going to smack their lips. <laughs> one of them going to catch an attitude. One of them going to raise their voice. Now, hear this. The one that raises his voice first is the one that's always wrong.
The one who raises his voice first is the one that's wrong. Because truth doesn't have to shout. <laughs> Look at verse number 16. But if he will not hear, if y'all are going back and forth, voices are starting to raise, words are beginning to be thrown, chairs are now being turned over. Take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, this is a biblical precedent that we operate with in the church. When there are spats among brothers and sisters or sisters and sisters and brothers and brothers, this is how we handle conflict in the house of God. How are we supposed to? Because some of y'all's salvation is still downloading. You know, the wheel is still spinning. You know, your computer gets stuck. It's still downloading. It's the little pinwheel. And some of y'all forget that y'all are saved for a moment. And you go from zero to 100, just like that. But I want you to hear this, everybody. Listen, I tried one-on-one. -on -one. I tried to be cordial one-on-one. -on -one. I want to make sure that, my, that the Christ in me is not offended by anything that I would do or say. So I'm going to take another witness, not to corroborate me, not to put me in the best light, but I want to follow a biblical precedent about how to resolve issues. Verse number 17. Now you got two or three more people with you. You don't went to them once. You brought a couple of the brothers, a couple of the sisters with you. In verse number 17. And if he refuses to hear them, then you got to tell it to the church. That's what we call putting them on blast. Because now everybody is going to know what's going on. And hear this, everybody. You get to resolve conflict and nobody knows about it. People that know how to re resolve conflict very well, people on the outside don't know about it. But if they don't hear you, take them before the church. And the church there is not the church right here. It's not the open body. It's the leaders of the church. It's called, it's, it's, it's the better way to translate that is church leaders or church elders. But if he refuses to hear the church... Let him be to you as a heathen or a tax collector. Now, Matthew could not have found two worse words to put in this gospel. If he would have tried his best, his best, his best, his best, his readers, when they hear tax collector, his readers, when they hear heathen, are thinking the lowest of the low. He said, if they choose not to listen to the church, treat them like a heathen or a tax collector. That means you've went through a biblical process. And I want to I walk you through this before we get back to Acts chapter number 16. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. How many of you heard that at 2 o'clock in the morning on BET? After they send you the miracle spring water. After they give you the red blood prayer handkerchief, they say, whatever I loose on earth is loose in heaven. Whatever I bound on earth is bound in, on, in heaven. Has nothing to do with prosperity at all. But if we follow the church discipline and it's still bound after verse number 18, then guess what? You live life bound until you resolve the issue. That means you're bound on earth. Please hear that, everybody. Uh, married couples, you don't just get to go to bed mad. You have to resolve conflict or else conflict is bound to you. But if you do it right, the Bible also says whatever is loose on earth is loose in heaven. Now, please hear this. Satan is waiting for these traps in our lives. Satan feasts off of unresolved conflict. The wedge that he drives in relationships when there are problems and they are not resolved out biblically, he feasts on them to the point that it will be two months down the road, three months down the road, and you still talking about the thing that y'all were arguing about last year. And the intimacy in the relationship is shot. It's gone. Because all of that resentment and all of that hate has eroded away at that whole thing you call love. 
When there's unresolved conflict in our lives, Satan has a field day. And then he says this in verse number 19. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my father who is in heaven. So when we resolve conflict and I've honored you and you've honored me, we haven't degraded each other by cussing each other out. Listen, you're too old to be cussing people out, saints. Like you should have enough Jesus in you not to be cussing people out. That's not resolving conflict. That's leading to the conflict being bound on earth. He says, if you do this right, my father who is in heaven will do it for you. Then comes verse 20. For wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of of them. Now, I want you to think about this. If you are that person that will never apologize, go back over to your right to the book of Acts and we'll finish back out in Acts chapter number 16. Acts chapter number 16, verse number uh, 38. You know, and I'm thinking about this in real time. You know, conflict sometimes tends, uh, tends to find you, even when you're not looking for it. And people will test your patience. Uh, we got kids. Kids sometimes test our patience. Spouses sometimes test our patience. Don't look at me too close. I just said spouse. You ain't got to look at me. Church folks, the world we live in kind of test our patience. But the arrogance of not being able to apologize is deeply rooted in pride. And saints, you're never more like Satan than when you're walking in pride. See, I've just found out that later on in life, as, you, as God allows you to live and to discover, you'll find that things just ain't that serious no more. And somebody that's lived a little bit testified to that, it's just like... It's, it's just not that serious no more. Like, I'm going to let you do you. I'm going to do me. We're going to be happy. But you, 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 like, when I say I'm sorry, I don't lose by saying I'm sorry. I don't lose. But you know what we think, Deacon Brian. If I tell them I'm sorry, then they think they got one up on me. <laughs> They're going to treat me like I'm soft. But not apologizing is deeply rooted in pride. And you're never more like Satan than when you're walking in pride. I want you to see this in verse number 38. And the officers told these words to the magistrates. And when they heard, um, they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Because Paul understood who he was. The magistrates realized that they had imprisoned these men without a just cause and without a public trial. When they came and pleaded with them and they brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. Verse number 40. Watch this. It's a beautiful verse. So they went out from the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Ever, um, you know, my wife came into my office. At, you know, I'm pulled over after. Did I tell you it was an unjust traffic stop? Oh, okay. I want to make sure I said that. I just want to make sure I said that on the camera. Because I'm going to use this in court. Uh, I didn't do... I didn't do the stuff that you see on YouTube. Why are you pulling me over? Didn't do that. Took it on the chin. When I saw the lights, rolled all the windows down, front and back. No, I'm serious. That's what I did. I rolled all the windows down. So they had a clear sight as he was coming up to my vehicle so that he could see nothing was out of order. And he's talking, and he's talking. And I took the ticket, put it in my visor, and said, in my exact words, officer, praying for you guys. You guys are doing tremendous work. And drove off. Now, as I drove off,
But I go into my office, my wife comes in, and she can visibly see that I'm disturbed. And she said, how's your day going? I said, not good. Not, not, not good. Well, my wife, I want you to see this. Here she is. She knows me well enough that she just walked out. And as soon as she walked out the door, I said, hold on, that wasn't right. Because she's, she's not that cop. So I called her back in. And I began to tell her about the unjust traffic stop <laughs> that I am going to fight. And I said to myself, this situation could have went one or two ways. I chose to make it go into the way that was beneficial for me. I made a choice right then and there. You can do something stupid. <laughs> but I made a decision that was best for me in that moment. I want you to think about this in our own life, because I, I, as I'm looking and playing that stuff back in my mind, I see Satan leaning against that fire hydrant as he was giving me that ticket. He's like, just say something. Just say something to him. You know you didn't run that stop sign. You know you didn't. Just say something. Just say something. I'm telling you, I heard, Eric, I heard it. But there's one thing I can't beat. It's that cop's radio. And I'm sitting there thinking about all of this stuff in milliseconds, flying through my head, flying through my head, flying through my head, flying through my head. And God says, when I say God says, I didn't hear him say this. But I felt like he, I felt like he said it. I felt like he gave me Exodus 14 and 14. I felt like he gave me Exodus 14 and 14. Be still. The battle is not yours. <laughs> I felt like it. Now, maybe that could have just been me. I don't know. But I felt like God gave me Exodus 14 and 14. Satan fuels off of dissension. Whenever there's dissension in our lives, best believe Satan is somewhere lurking around it. Husbands and wives, when we're not on the same page, Satan is somewhere around it. When there's dissension between us, Satan is somewhere around it. And if we don't fix it and fix it quickly, we give him a foothold in our lives and he's going to unleash hell in it. He doesn't play fair, y'all. So I want to encourage you, if you are that person that does not apologize, um, let me just tell you this, you, you're not losing anything. Jesus apologized to God for something that he didn't do. He died on the cross for our sins. That was an apology to God for the sin that was created by mankind. He didn't lose anything, he actually gained. As we mature in Christ, Satan is going to be knocking on the doors of our life every single day, setting traps for us every single day, hoping that we would fall into it. So saints, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, it's not that serious, y'all. It's not that serious. Let a fool be a fool. Let a fool be a fool and live to fight another day. And y'all say amen to that. Live to fight another day. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we do thank you, Lord. How to resolve conflict. How to deal with people that are sometimes very difficult to deal with. Help us, Lord God, to bridle our tongues. Father, I pray that you would grab us, Lord, that you would quicken us when we're getting ready to get ourselves in a position that we cannot easily get out of. And Father, we're human. We are susceptible to all of the frailties of life. But Father, I pray that you would lead and guide us by the Holy Spirit. You know that the enemy waits and he lies to set a trap for us, Lord. But Father, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, help us to be aware 
that we may be able to avoid those traps. I pray for every married couple in this place, Lord. Every mother, every father, children, Lord God. I pray for relationships right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, if we have wronged another, help us to be mindful of that, Lord. Father, I pray that you would give us boldness and courage and that you would help us to beat back pride to make situations right. Father, thank you for what you're doing in this place and in your people. Father, we do love you so very much. And Father, in those many times that we have messed up and missed the mark, Father, praying that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that you would set us anew. Thank you, even right now, Lord, for what you're doing in the hearts of your people. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that the word that was discussed today was clear and that we have found practical ways by which to imply it in our own lives. Help us, Lord God, to be doers of the word and not just hearers. Thank you, Lord, for the Church of Bethel's family. Thank you for the members of the Church of the Bethel's family and for Harvest Point, for Pastor August, for Pastor Scott, everyone who labors in the vineyard. Thank you, Lord God, for using us. Father, we love you and we bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. Let's give God a hand praise in Jesus' name. Deacons, you may come. Can I say that? Okay. Come on, uh, deacons. I want you to look in your programs real quick while the deacons just, just hold up right here in your programs. At the bottom in the middle, there is a, um, what is it called? We are one. It's at the bottom. And it's got a little QR code right there. If you participate in any ministry here at the Church of Bethel's family, we need you to scan that QR code because that's the leadership conference that's going to be happening on July 14th and 15th. And it's going to be in partnership with the church, excuse me, with Harvest Point, one church at Harvest Point. And it's going to be here at the Church of Bethel's family. It's going to be some absolutely fabulous topics with some great speakers um, that are going to be a part of those two days. So please scan that. If you're thinking about getting involved in ministry, scan that and come out. It's completely free of charge for you if you come, and I guarantee you, you're going to be blessed. I guarantee you, you're going to be blessed. Father, in Jesus' name, would you take this offering, Lord, and multiply it 30, 60, and 100-fold. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen, and thank God. You may go with it. Okay, so we got that coming up on, on July 14th and 15th, which is in a couple of weeks. Uh, the Sneaker Gala. Um, any teens in here? Okay. Listen, if you have a teen, middle school, high school, we're going to comp them for free. Okay? We're going to comp them for free this coming Friday at 6 p.m. from 6 to 9. Um, all the tickets have been sold, but that's not a problem. You're still going to be able to come in. But ladies, we're asking that you would dress up in your nice little dresses with your tennis shoes on. And fellas, that you would do what you do. Now, fellas, if you don't have a suit, we've given about 25 boys free suits today in heavenly hands. And I got about 15 more suits in the back in Reverend Ford's office. So please do not let you not having a suit be the reason that you don't come. It's going to be a time of uh, fellowship, food, dancing, and all of that other wonderful good stuff. So please help them come out on this coming Friday uh, from 6 until 9. BFCA uh, summer camp, is it open, closed for Carolina Creek? Come here for a second. Come on, it's 8 o'clock. Come on up here. Speak into my chest. Come on. <laughs> Go ahead. I can't focus. <laughs> BCA summer camp. Um, yes, yes, the summer camp for Carolina Creek um, is this Sunday. So for those that have third to sixth graders, we still have some spaces available. Um, we do have flyers that are in... Uh, 
got those doors by 121. So we're just asking that you register your kiddos if they would like to attend the camp. And yes, DFCA still has spots available. That's the everyday camp. That is Monday through Friday. Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> All right, lastly, come on up. Because, see, I love this. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not wearing church shoes for the rest of the summer. Um, let me tell you something. Marriage is good. Don't let nobody fool you. Marriage is good. It is ordained by God. And the Bible says that marriage is honorable among all things. And I love it when I see young people decide to get married. Now, I'm going to tell all the single ladies that I got some single men. Okay. Big facts. Okay. <laughs> but I want, I want my dear brother to, to announce what uh, he did. you do that today? Okay, let's, can you make the announcement to the people of God? Shake it. <laughs> uh, congratulations. Congratulations. And congratulations. Uh, I will tell you something about Brother Tay. He started coming to the men's meeting when? Okay. So he's been coming to the men's meeting, and we talk a lot about family. We talk a lot about marriage. We talk a lot about loving and protecting our wives. And I want to tell you on behalf of the Church of Bethel's family, congratulations. Amen. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're not welcome to the club yet, but when you get in the club, welcome to the club. Congratulations, and Congratulations. Thank you, man. Congratulations, my sister. <laughs> All right, family. Uh, look to your neighbor. Look to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I love you. Now, if you don't love them, say, I'm trying to love you. I'm trying. <laughs> Everybody, thank y'all so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so if you bring, are they in the academy? Okay, so if he can come up here anytime from 9 until 3, we can get him fitted for a suit. Yes, before Friday. He didn't talk to myself or Reverend Ford. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, won't you high five somebody? We love you guys. Thank you for coming out. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you for all that you do. Remember, resolve conflict. It ain't that serious. Breathe. Not that serious. Best, I love you, man. Ain't nothing I can do about it. Bless you. We love you. Thank God. Bye-bye.